Well, my grandfather, whom I am named after, was lost on the Isle, and his body was never recovered. Uh, I, I didn't know much about it until I was 10, until in 1958 there was talk of uh, having a, a memorial erected overlooking the beasts of Holm. And I, I'd been out fishing with my father there, and he never mentioned a thing. But uh, I, I, uh, I suddenly realised that he just didn't want to talk about it. And my sister was older than me, and she didn't know anything about it. We knew her grandfather had lost, been lost in the First World War, but we, we thought it was just part of the war and hadn't even inquired about it, which reflected badly on ourselves. However, uh, even when I decided to try and write a book with, in conjunction with Donald John MacLeod, I didn't know much about my, father's, my grandfather's uh, uh, life at sea. And then, uh, as part of just looking up everybody, I, f I found that he, he had a quite a he had quite an experience during the war. He uh, he just didn't uh, serve at a naval establishment all war. He had been torpedoed, for instance, uh, when 49 men on the, on the ship he was on, HMS Calgarian, which was an armed mer merchant cruiser, they, they were lost off Rathlin Island uh, when it was sunk by four torpedoes from a German U-boat. So he survived that, and he, not only that, before that he, he had been... Uh, at Halifax in Nova Scotia at the time of the Great Explosion. It was the biggest explosion on Earth until the Hiroshima bomb. And uh, there was a ship's anchor blown two and a half miles across the city, which was devastated. And uh, there was hundreds or, or thousands killed. And uh, to, to have survived that, and then survived the sinking of the Calgarian, and then to be lost on the island, was a, a tragedy. The, he wasn't lucky a third time, and uh, it, it left, uh, never got my father to speak about it at all. He, he did speak a little bit to my sister when he was 80, but uh, it certainly had a, an impact on him. His mother had been lost, uh, had, had died of TB in 1911, so that he was effectively an orphan himself and his brother. His brother stayed at 57 South Braggart with uh, relatives. My father was brought up at 21 North Shore Bust and then moved into town to live with an auntie in, when he was 14, working in Miller's Garage for six months, and then he uh, started working with Roderick Smith Limited and became the manager there and worked for them for 65 years. Roderick Smith being a relative from Braga. Uh, so Braga folk were truly kind, and uh, I think he was grateful for that, and he, he served in the Second World War in the Royal Army Medical Corps, but didn't see much action apart from bombing. He, he was actually stationed in Leeds, which is a city I lived in myself, and also my nephew stayed in Leeds. Uh, uh, I think a few people know I have a connection with Leeds uh, through the years. I, I, I really uh, don't know what else to say about my grandfather, except that his body was never found, and we could never go to visit the gra a grave. And... Uh, so a, a great uh, sadness in that. Uh, I, I knew my other grand grandmother didn't have a, the grandfather. Funnily enough, believed or not, it's another connection to the island because he was the bosun on the Sheila, which was the mail boat at the time, and he was there that night. And uh, he actually went down to his house, uh, which was then called Battery Park. It's now Battery Park Road, and was full of Nishoks. He, he was from Ness, and they all headed up town when they heard he, him saying that the Isle was in the rocks at home. So that was another memory uh, from the family and another connection. Of course, she was also aboard the Sheila on the 1st of January 1927 when she grounded off Skye and became a total loss. As a direct result, none of our family go, could go uh, on the sea on the 1st of January at any time. It's just a, a, a bad uh, date for us all. They, they came from all all round uh, the country, and one or two, there's one man at least from Gibraltar. They, they, they came from about 130 different locations, which showed you the authorities had a great, uh, you know, 
problem in getting all the people together to get onto trains. Uh, there was quite, quite a number, I think it was over 30 of them at HMS Pembroke, which was the, the barracks at Chatham. And there was another similar number, perhaps slightly less, uh, at, at Portsmouth, uh, the, the base there, and a few at Devonport. But the vast majority of them came from their, their ships, and uh, some of them were as small as launches and some were as big as battleships. And they were all around the, the country from Liverpool, Ireland, uh, the East Coast, the South Coast, and of course uh, Rosyth, and uh, up at Scapa Flow. So that when, when th 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 this all uh, compounded the, the trains being late to Kyle in the first instance, because they had to wait for trains to arrive in Inverness and then sh uh, move them over to Kyle. Uh, uh, of course, there was trains coming from Scapa Flow. You know, the, the men had to sail from Orkney to, to uh, Thurso and then by train down to... So, so it wasn't just coming from the south. They were. Uh, the, the men, it was a very tiring experience. One man uh, from Stornoway, uh, the first man at the farmers, actually, uh, Alexander McKeever, said that he took 23 hours from Portsmouth to reach Inverness itself. So with all the changes at Glasgow, Edinburgh, etc., so the men would have been pretty exhausted by the time that they got to Kyle. Uh, the, 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 the trains went to Kyle in, 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 it was supposed to be in three lots, but they actually went in two lots, but they were, they were quite late. And that led to them not being home before midnight, which would have made a great difference. Well, the finds of my re research uh, were well, that there was 174 Lewis men lost, seven Harris men, and 20 crew members, well, well 18 crew members and two men who were travelling as passengers to it, the HMS Islay base at the Battery. Uh, now, o o on the memorial itself, it, 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 it says 205, but th th nobody's ever come up with, with names uh, for 205 men. Uh, it, it, it was known... Uh, a lot of people agree with me that there's 174 Lewis men and seven Harris men. Some people had 175, and it's 175 in Sea Sorrow, which was written by the, the Stornway Gazette. But one of the names, just the man didn't exist. He, he was listed from Dune Carloway, but the address was of one of the others, one of the survivors. But there was no such man. You know, if you look up Croft histories, there was no such person. So that takes that man away. And then the, 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 the naval historian Don Kendell, who uh, has compiled a list of all the men that were lost from 1900 until 1945, or perhaps even after the Second World War, day by day, uh, he came up with all the men that were lost on the 1st of January 1919, and his lists agree with mine. But, of course, that was for the Royal Navy and Royal Naval Reserve. There were some mercantile marine or mercantile marine reserve men from Lewis aboard. And the rec records for these are very, very difficult to get. The, I've been able to acquire the, 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 the naval records for the uh, Royal Naval, sorry, the Royal Navy, Royal Naval Reserve and Royal Naval Vi Vi uh, Volunteer Reserve. But... I haven't been able to get the, the mercantile marine men. That's now Merchant Navy, of course. Uh, the, the, the title Merchant Navy was given by King George V at the end of the First World War and was known as that ever since. Well, I haven't been able to establish exactly what, what happened. It's, I'm just putting forward my, my our own views of, of what happened. Uh, but c clearly the, the Admiralty, uh, everybody was uh, questioned at the Court of Inquiry, the Public Inquiry, uh, but the, the Admiralty themselves were never asked any direct questions in court. I mean, Admiral Boyle wasn't asked any questions. He wasn't, uh, didn't even appear to be in, in court all the time. Uh, he, he should have been up there asking why... Uh, Asked why, he only sent one man out to four locations in Stornoway to summon help. I mean, he sent a man to Newton 
to to summon the lifeboat Cox, uh, John McLean, who's a brother of Murdo McLean of the, 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 the shop that's just closed down in Cromwell Street. And he also had to go to the back of the Royal Hotel, he was the fr front of it, first of all, to, to get the, the secretary of the lifeboat. And he also went to the near the Caledonian Hotel to get a taxi driver there, who he didn't manage to, to raise from his slumbers, and then went uh, out to uh, Behead, to 51 Behead, to try and uh, get, get Mr Henderson, one of the taxi drivers there, to get, get him up. And by the time he, he reported back to the, the Imperial Hotel where the Admiralty were based, four hours had elapsed. So, I mean, the Admiralty themselves weren't covered in glory at all. And that, that's why the public felt they were trying to blame the locals. They tried to blame the lifeboat for not going out when it was a pulling lifeboat with oars, and yet the drifter budding rose was standing off the isle, unable to get close because of the waves. And no questions were asked as why the budding rose didn't go in, etc. Uh, there was just... It, it was an attempt to divert attention away from the Admiralty at all times. And the fact that none of the, the isle officers... Uh, that there was the, the, the crew actually was only at half strength, and you only had the commander Mason and Lieutenant Quarter, the navigating officer, and there were two officers down in the engine room, uh, and they, they they were all lost. So uh, the, the, the they put all, all, all the questions went on one individual who had been on the at the helm up until one o'clock. That was uh, uh, James McLean from Campbellton, and. That man was called back to a couple of times uh, to, to uh, answer the questions. One of the, the, the things that really... I've, 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 I've found this out, that only about 17 men of the survivors were questioned, yet they took two men who were on the platform at Kyle Hall Station were asked questions. What they were going to add to the, the outcome, I don't know, but surely all 80 men... Uh, that survived should have been uh, witnessed in court. There had been an admiralty inquiry before that, and uh, all the men had to write a sworn affidavit. And uh, they uh, did that. There was one man excused for a little while because down Harris he had a doctor's line, but eventually he did fill it in. And uh, I think from that, that's why they selected the, the men they did to appear as witnesses, because they would probably give a credible uh, opinion of the Admiralty. And the, the thing is, these s sworn statements, where are they now? There's no sign of them. And that's what makes people feel there was a whitewash. It, it left it uh, just shortly after half past seven at night, and the Sheila followed about half an hour later. Uh, the the Isler that, that sailed, it, it could do about ten knots, and its predecessor, the previous Isler, could have done, could do seventeen knots. So if the old Isler had been there with experienced hands, uh, it's quite likely they'd have been in Stornway before the gale even got up. But uh, it was at five to two. Uh, that she struck the beasts of Holm. They were running late, although there was a gale behind them. She was a old, much older yacht, being built in 1881 uh, by and Ferguson at Leith, whereas the other uh, island had been there beforehand was built in 1902, and a, a much more modern and larger yacht with more accommodation for men. Well, the, the, the first, we are moving the chapters around, but the, the first bit will essentially uh, a prelude to the disaster, uh, talking about Lewis and Harris before the, the war and what the people did and about the RNR, what the RNR is, because uh, that, that was the majority of the men were there, uh, talking about... 
Well, the, 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 the difficulties people had, because oh, oh, out with Stornoway, there was hardly a slated house, and yet these men were coming out fully uniformed and ready to go to war. They even went to Fraserburgh and Peter Head and Chris Agat, and some had their kit bags with them and reported to Chatham, to Devonport, etc. On the, th the 3rd of August 1914, when they were summoned, they were ready to, to go and ready to fight, and yet they were reservists, so, and they were right into battle from the word go. So that's what we were setting that up. And then there's the, the, the way the, the war had ended and then how the men were coming up for New Year. All the English sailors ha had, uh, had Christmas off and the Irish, Welsh and Scots sailors were getting New Year off. So we built that up and then eventually there's the disaster itself, followed on by... Uh, the, the stories of the survivors and some of the, the men, uh, then the, the inquiry and the aftermath and how people reacted. There's the Eiler uh, Fund as well, which was raised for the families. Uh, we, we cover a who's who of every man that was aboard, whether he drowned or whether he was rescued and what happened to him, including the dates of death of the survivors. We've only one man we were unable to find. He had emigrated to America and uh, he was, his name annoys me because he was Malcolm McDonald as well and he was from Ness. Uh, and uh, in fact, his relatives said that he went to, we have the boat that he went on. Uh, he, he was a fitter, uh, an engine room artificer aboard the, when he was on the aisle there. And he just disappeared and never wrote home. Uh, but we've got all them. We also have a list of all the children that were born to the men that were lost. Some of them, of course, were bo born. Six or seven were born after their fathers were lost. So that was tragedy you know, in itself, some of them six months later. And, uh, of course, some of the babies died as well. There's a lot of tragedies. And what one young girl, she was 19, was buried with her father. Uh, had been lost on the aisle there. A lot of tragedies like that. We talk about the supernatural and superstition. We talk about uh, the war memorials and the graves where they're buried around the island. And uh, I tell you, covered, make it as, like a, almost like a, a complete record of, of the aisle there. And also, we talk quite a bit about the vessels themselves. Uh, for instance, uh, not many people will know that. The base here was called HMS Eiler, and so any time that somebody says HMS Eiler sank, they mean that the base of the battery and the the, the, the harbour itself with over 100 ships sank. You know. uh, the, the, the yacht was HMS MY Eiler, and the original one went away in, at the end of October 1918, and then the Amalthea arrived and picked up uh, the name, and when the other Isla went away to be decommissioned. She took the Amalthea's name. And an in an another interesting thing is that after the Isla sank on uh, the 1st of January 1919, a tug in Stornway Harbour became HM Tug Isla because the base has to have a ship named after, a small ship named after it. So there were, it gets quite confusing if you try to look up all these Isla. You have to know which vessel you're talking about. Well, I, I think some of the sailors at the beginning of the war, Britain had a very, very small army and uh, had a very large navy. And all these reservists coming along, uh, they, they had more uh, men than boats because they had requisitioned a lot of trawlers and drifters and things like that for, for uh, anti-submarine and anti-mine warfare purposes. And they hadn't been requisitioned then. And the first sea lord at the beginning of, of the war was one Winston Churchill who suddenly had a brainwave that to save Belgium f from falling into uh, into the hands of the Germans uh, you, you could get a, a battalions of Royal Naval Reservists and so quite a, a large number of Lewis men in, in especially went and fought in the defence of Antwerp and you probably might have heard that over a hundred of them uh, went into Holland to escape being captured and were interned there at Groningen for the duration of the war 
although they were able to come home and do uh, field work and cut the peats, but they had to return or they would have been, uh, the, the deal was off. So the, the, there is a, a, a photo which will appear in the book of Donald Murray from 37 North Tolsta in the trenches with, uh, he's got a naval hat on, he's got a gun and he's got uh, it's like a, a Mexican bandit with bullets uh, and a bandolero around him. But that's how they fought. He, he managed to escape actually th through France and rejoin ships and uh, in fact was involved in the rescue of people off the Lusitania. So that's just I'm throwing in a little story that will appear in the book. Uh, but I, th I think people th think, oh, they were coming back, uh, that they weren't in a regular pattern. You know, they were, they were just anybody would go aboard. But all, all the soldiers that were at Kyle that night went on the Sheila. And uh, al also some sailors and the, the civilians went on the Sheila, whereas all the, the, the rest that went aboard were either from the Royal Navy or Mercantile Marine. And there was one man travelling back to Stornos, a Royal Marine, who considers himself neither a soldier or a sailor. If you talk to Marines, they're quite proud about that. Well, I think I need to go through every single man that was lost, actually, because I think none of them is is uh, greater than the other, but I, th I think one that really does stand out as, as an example was uh, Kenneth McPhail from Arnold, who had been uh, on a ship that was torpedoed, and the U-boat did surface, and he didn't see it, and it picked up four other survivors, and it was thought for a long time that he was the only survivor, and he spent 36 hours swimming in the Mediterranean before, uh, uh, after the ship, the, the SS Cambric had been sunk, and uh, he, 36 hours in the water, how he survived, and he was, he came ashore at Cape Churchill, and uh, he was hospitalised for about two months with exposure, so uh, he survived that, and yet he was lost on the island, just a sh huge tragedy that somebody could survive such an ordeal and then not be able to tell a story to, well, his grandchildren or children, great-great-grandchildren, the story would have been one of, uh, he could have written a book about, I'm sure.